first black woman to be CEO of an NBA team. I had stage three C, colon cancer. My husband literally ended up in a rehab hospital and had to learn how to walk and talk all over again. You were trying for the first 10 years of your marriage yes. to have a child. Yes. Four second trimester miscarriages. Yes, four. Welcome to Vault Empowers Talk. So we don't just scratch the surface. We dive deep into the lives of some of the world's most influential leaders and change makers. I'm your host, Brandi Harvey. But before I introduce my guest for the day, I need you to go ahead and do me a favor. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you do not miss your daily dose of inspiration and motivation. But without further ado, y'all, I my mind is blown right now. I get to sit across from this amazing woman today, Sint Marshall. She is the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks. In February of 2018, Marshall became the first black woman to be a CEO in the history of the NBA. For 36 years, Sint Marshall worked in leadership for AT&T with a role focused on improving workplace culture and encouraging diversity, equity, and inclusion. Sint Marshall is the author of the best-selling book, You've Been Chosen, Thriving Through the Unexpected, where she discusses faith, family, and the journey of success and failure. Sint Marshall is one of the most influential business leaders in America. She is a wife. She is a mother. She is a history maker. She is a trailblazer. Vault Empowers Talks welcome the phenomenal Sint Marshall to the show. Ooh. It's so good to be here, sister. Oh, oh listen. my goodness, I feel good. Listen, you should. <laughs> I, I'm so glad I can go ahead and put them notes down, baby, because I feel like I know you know you. Oh, I know you know you. <laughs> In fact, I need to take you around the world with me. Like, listen, let's go around the world. I love that introduction. I'm down. Take me today. Oh, where, where are we going I next? I love you. <laughs> Who knows what the Lord has planned? Listen. And he's got big plans for you. We'll talk about that later. I big am plans. so, I mean, honestly, St. Marshall, it is, it is such a pleasure because... When I read your book, I mean, which is a phenomenal book, if, if all my listeners who are watching, you have got to read this amazing story. Thank you. Talk about thriving through the unexpected. Mm. You have had a journey from your childhood. You have had a series of firsts in your life. Yes. Being the first black woman to be the CEO of an NBA team is not your first. You were the no. first black uh, president of your high school class. You yes. were the first black cheerleader at Cal State Berkeley. You were the first black woman to lead the Chamber of Commerce at in North Carolina. Oh, you did your homework. I did. <laughs> you did your What's homework, up? sister. Listen. Yes. You uh, being the first is nothing new for you. It's not. It's not yeah. because okay. Usually when I'm the first, I don't know I'm the first. Mm. You're just on this journey and you're just going. You know, you're abiding in your calling. You're doing what you know what the Lord wants you to do. People are telling you to do things. Yeah. You know, adults are speaking into your life. And so you just go and do things. Yeah. One time, the only one time when I really wanted to be first is when I was the first black senior class president. Because you want to do that speech. I want to do that speech. <laughs> That's exactly right. I was at my sister's graduation and I saw those two white guys on the stage and I looked at my mom. I was in the ninth grade. And I said, can a black girl be wow. a senior class president? She said, honey, you can do whatever you want to do. And I said, okay, when I graduate... I want two black girls on the stage. So then I talked my, one of my buddies into running for student body president, and I ran for class president, and we both won. Wow. I said, okay, good. We'll be up on the stage giving the speeches yeah. and calling the names. And yeah. then I realized, okay, we got to govern this class in this school, though. Yeah. So we got some work to do. Yeah. And it was fun. It was fun. But it was a dream come true. And that was the only time I sought to be first. Any other time, I didn't know I was first. Yeah. And then once I hear that, uh, because people ask, you know, do you feel pressure and all that? I said, it makes me really want to do a great job yeah. because I just want to take all doubt away that these positions I end up in, black women, black people can do these jobs great too. Yeah. And so I just want to really show excellence so we can just take all doubt away. And then I commit that I won't be the last. I might be the first. Yeah. But I won't be the last. Yeah. So then my job is to work on the pipeline and get others to work on the pipeline. Yeah. So that it won't so we'll get to a point where we won't have all these first. But I think the real part of your journey that people have often missed is how faith has really been the cornerstone because you said your mother gave you two books. She gave you the math book and she gave you the Bible. The Bible. She said, stay Those in two. both of them and you're gonna get up out of here. That's it. 
That's yeah. it. Math book and a Bible. I mean, that's the secret to my success is those two books at a very early age. Yeah. And so many times I had to rely on one or the other or both. Mm. And so yeah. that's what I've done for my kids. I said, you know what? And I have four, as you know, and I know we'll talk about it. I said, there are only two things I can really give my kids as a parent that I think I can really give them a foundation in Christ and a good education. And so one day I thought about that. I said, where did that come from? And then I had to laugh. I said, that's what I got. Yeah. That's what my mother gave me, a foundation in Christ, so that I would know that I didn't have to carry this load by myself, that there is truly a plan. I mean, there's that scripture, Jeremiah 29, yeah. 11. There is a plan for me to prosper yeah. and not harm me, to give me hope in the future. And so I have to open myself up to that plan. Yeah, I got to prepare, and there's things I have to do. But there is a good plan. Uh, for me. And so that's where that foundation comes in. And I've tried to pass that on to the kids because, you know, it's so easy to get upset, yeah. discouraged, depressed. Yeah. I mean, we're dealing with a lot of that right now, depression with our young people and all that. And I just said, no, there is a plan and something that can get you through this. And there's something bigger operating in your life. And that's what I was taught. There's something bigger operating. So never, ever give up. Unexpected things will happen. Bad things do happen to good people. Yeah, yeah. But you know that there is a God and there is a plan. And then you got to prepare and you got to handle your business and handle your schoolwork and all that. And that's where that uh, math book came in. Yeah. My mother had that math book in my hand and I am a math geek to this day. Uh, people are always surprised to come and work with me or for me because I'm a people person. Yeah, right? yeah. But I'm a true math geek. Yeah. I love my numbers. I love my numbers. Wow. And look, my, my nephew was just in here. I love in, him. I'm going to in. kidnap him. <laughs> Listen. I love and him. And you're going to bring him back. Because, child, once he start really talking, honey, you're going to want to bring him okay, back. Okay, but you did your homework. So, you know, I steal children. Okay? You know, I steal them right off the television. Okay? So, bring me my baby. <laughs> Listen. You know what? What's, what I felt was so amazing is, you know, when I think about your story, right, and... Even the part about faith, you you talk in the book in in this wonderful book. You talk in the book and you you talk about a promotion oh, that you yes. were up for, mm -hmm. and in one of the promotions that you were up for, because we talk about all the hard work that people got to put in. You said right. it. You it's going to take hard work for you it to is. get wherever you're going, but you were up for this promotion, mm -hmm. and the woman sits this magazine on your desk and shows you these black people with the haircut yes. and dressed in white. And told you this is how you should look. And you need to stop saying blessed and start saying lucky because it sounds too churchy. I and just that, love you. Yeah. Like you really did your homework. <laughs> you know, I do this kind of stuff all the time, right? Lisa, I know. Oh, you did your homework. Yeah. I just love this so much. I mean, truly, I know you're a professional and all that, but you you did extra. Yeah. So thank you. That means a lot to me. Yeah, that means a lot to me. You're so welcome. So on that story... Um, I was getting promoted to officer. I mean, that's the highest level, obviously, you can go in a corporation. Uh, 110 officers in a company of 250,000 or so people. And so when I got this call that evening, I knew it was a big deal. Um, I hadn't looked for that promotion. Uh, I had a desire to get to, to director level when I first came to the company. I was in this fast track management program. And anything after that uh, was gravy. And so I get this call from my boss. I just walked in the house. And she said, you know, I just want to let you know you've been promoted. She had just gotten the call. And so she said, okay, so uh, here's some things I want you to do. And she said, I want you to cut your hair. And I said, you want me to cut my hair? And so my husband is in the background. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I got a barber. Don't worry about it. Don't worry <laughs> about it. I said, I'm not thinking, where is this going? What does this yeah. have to do with the job? And so she said, now, you can't be called sent. You have to be Cindy. Yeah. Because I don't know what a sent is. Who knows what a sent is? You could be Cynthia or Cindy. Well, I've been sent my whole life. And at this point, you know, I'm almost 40 years old. So I've been sent my whole life. And then she said, and I put a magazine on your desk. And so the people, she says, all black people, and they're in white, and the hair is short. And I'm like, what is she doing, right? <laughs> then she told me, you know, kind of clothes she thought I should wear. And she even told me about St. John. I didn't know anything about St. John. So I kept that piece of advice. I know, that's right. Uh -huh, don't play. Okay. <laughs> so, but then she said, and I don't want a lot of people coming into your office. So you're going to have to tone it down a little bit. You're just a little bit too happy. Mm. And I'm thinking, if you know where I've come from mm. and how good God has been to me, you would rejoice and be happy every day, too. Mm. But she said, I couldn't be that happy. 
And then she said, this is where it, she just crossed over. And, and, and in defense of her, she meant well. Yeah. She yeah. really was yeah. telling me this yeah. because she thought this is kind of, you know, the image I needed yeah. to project to do well. Yeah. So then she said, and you can't use words like blessed. You have to say things like lucky. I said, okay, hold on a minute. What if I don't think I'm lucky? Hmm. What if I believe that I'm, what if I believe I'm blessed? I said, in fact, what if I know yeah. I'm blessed? Yeah. And yeah. she said, well, no, but you just can't use yeah. those kind of churchy words. And she just gave me this whole profile of me. And I finally said, you know what? I said, when I started with this company at 21 years old, I had a boss whose boss told me to take down my braids my first week or so in the, in the job, in the, in the company, take down my braids and take off my red shoes. And I went home and I stayed up all night with my sister and my mom and we took my braids out. Wow. And then they went and found me some shoes and a little outfit to wear because they had a certain look and they wanted me to do well. Yeah. So they, you know, I was in this fast track yeah. program with all these guys yeah. and they wanted me to do well. And so I told her, I said, you know what? That was 18, 19 years ago. Not anymore. I yeah. said, I'm not doing that again. Yeah. At some point I have to be sent. And I, I, you know, I got to a point in my career where I could do that because sometimes you can't do it. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you just can't yeah. take that kind of stand. Yeah. But but the, the funny part was I was so nervous about saying no because I want to keep my job. Yeah. So then I asked her to help me figure out how to say no to this promotion because I was not going to be the person who they wanted me to be. And I had already done well in this company. I loved Love, love the company. Okay. And so it actually seemed odd to me that this was happening. Yeah. But, you know, I'm like, okay, this is what I have to do to be an officer. I don't know any better. I don't know anything about the officer ranks or anything like that. I said, help me figure out yeah. how to say no. And so she says, I think you're making the right decision. Yeah. And so we, no, to say no. So yeah. She, so she came yeah. up, we came yeah. up with this whole little yeah. speech that she would give. She says, I'll deliver the message for you. I said, great. I said, I don't want to lose my current job. I'm a VP. I am higher than I ever thought I would be. I'm taking care of my family, extended family. I cannot lose my job. Because this promotion was going to give you like equity in the company. It was huge. Yeah. I mean, it's the highest one you can get. Right? Yeah. It was huge. And so, and so my husband knew that because he had worked for our company too. My father-in-law had yeah. retired from the yeah. company. And so my husband is in the background basically <laughs> saying, just go with it. Yeah. I got the barber. We can do whatever we need to do. Don't turn down this promotion. And I just said, I have to because you're asking me to be somebody else. So we came up with the words. She says, I think you're making the right decision. You're doing a great job where you are right now. They'll find somebody else. So we go through that. And I actually felt good about the decision. I felt good about her. She was going to deliver the news for me. And then a few minutes later, her boss called, and then the chairman of the company called. Yeah. And he said, sent. And he put the <laughs> emphasis on the T. I said, yes. He said, um, I just heard what happened. He said, let's do this all over again. He offered me the promotion, but before he did that, he described me to a T. He said, I know exactly who you are. He said, I've seen that little st uh, statue that you have on, on your door that said, Lord, there's nothing that happens today that you and I can't handle. He said, I've seen that little rock on your desk that said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He said, I know where you came from, girl. And he went through this whole yeah. thing. It was beautiful. I mean, I was in tears. Yeah. This is the chairman of the company. Yeah. And he said, so that's who we want to walk in the door tomorrow. Yeah. That's who we are promoting. He said, okay, what's your answer? I said, yes. Yeah. And he literally set me free. And when, when I, when I tell that story, I usually tell it not because I made some great decision. I mean, you get to a point in your life where you can make those kind of decisions. Sometimes you can't, often we can't. That story to me is really about the words of a leader. Him calling me yeah. and basically setting me free and say and telling me it's okay to be sent and it is okay to be my authentic self and all that is welcome in this company, which is what I always felt. Yeah. And he reinforced it. And I took the position and just did a lot of things with it. And the Lord opened up different platforms for me to use and it was great. Yeah. But it's because he set me free. I mean, but you were almost 40 years old at this point. Yes. And so think about all the women who are in corporate spaces yes. that are navigating through the business world, who are out here trying to forge a, and make a name for themselves with their career. Right. And they are not free. Right. No one's given them permission to break free. And that's what I think about often. And that's why sometimes I will, I, I mean, often I will go out and talk. I will go out and mentor. I have a yeah. lot of mentees. 
because, and then I talked to employers about it. In fact, uh, it was 2021. So it was my 40th anniversary of being a professional. And so on that day of my 40th anniversary, so it was the day I had started with AT&T, on that anniversary, I did uh, an Instagram post. And I had braids. I got my braids back. Yeah. And I basically kind of told the story. And then I gave a message to employers. My message to the black girls, I said, do you. Yeah. My message to the employers was you have to accept and appreciate what comes through your doors. And so I try to use my platform now to drive that message. We all bring something different. We bring something fabulous. Yeah. You don't want a cookie cutter uh, employee body. You want different people walking through your doors, looking different ways, bringing different backgrounds. The people who get up out of bed in the morning, those are the people who yeah. I want to walk in my doors. The dreams they have, the backgrounds they have, the culture they bring, the yeah. braids they bring, the mohawk, frohawk, all of that. Yeah. Bring it all in here yeah. to make us better. Yeah. And so I try to I try to live that out in our workplace. Yeah. At the Mavs, we have a set of values and they spell crafts. C R A F T S. Character, respect, authenticity, yeah. fairness, teamwork and safety, both physical and emotional safety. And we spend a lot of time talking about authenticity. We want people to be who they are when they get up out of bed and walk into our doors the same way. Yeah. So that's big for us. I mean, I think that that just speaks to Everything, every thread that has been woven along your journey, because even when I think about the, you know, some of the unconventional things, right, that you've yes. kind of been the first. And I mean, we go even we think about marriage and relationships. Right. Yes. You and your husband, Kenneth, have been you've known each other since you were 15 years yes. old. Y'all met <laughs> yes. at that DECA. <laughs> At that, at that DECA oh conference, goodness. honey, you came sashaying. He gave you that, that award, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that, that's so funny you bring that up because one of my sons, the one, uh, uh, Kenneth Anthony, he said, we tried to get him in DECA in high school. And so we said, okay, you need a list of clubs that you can get involved in. You know, yeah. we know you're swimming, playing soccer and all that, but we want you to get involved in the club. And they had DECA at his high school. Yeah. And so my husband said, what about DECA? He looked at my husband, he said, I'm not looking for a wife. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that's why you get in a deck and find a wife, which of course is not why you get a deck. But that is, that is where I met the boy. Okay. You, yeah. and so I've known him a long time and we've yeah. been married 40 years, 40 years. You've been married. Yeah. It'll be 41 in April. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It's kind of like up there. We're turning the water into wine. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be committed. You gotta be committed. Yeah. You were committed. And I think that that's, that's the beautiful part of your of your story because you and Kenneth made some hard decisions yes. in this commitment along the way. Yes, we did. Because even as you being the executive and most women are out here kind of faced with that same reality, right. you know, that they are in these key leadership positions. And sometimes, as your husband said, you know, the W-2s don't lie. They don't lie. They <laughs> speak for themselves. And that's what happened. When yeah. He ended up quitting his job. So we both showed up late to pick up the kids yeah. from daycare one night. Yeah. Okay. And they had turned the lights out. And they're walking my little honeys up the hallway. Anthony with his big eyes. <laughs> Shirley holding his hand. And I feel so bad. Mm -hmm. And I guess they were getting ready to call my mother because she's the yeah. emergency contact, right? And so I looked at Kenny and I said... Um, we, didn't, we did not adopt these kids for the daycare to raise them. I said, we have to figure something out here. And it was so traumatic for them because they are adopted. They do have abandoned abuse and neglect stories. And Anthony asked if he thought, he said he thought we had abandoned him. Wow. And so that just, that just, oh, girl, that got to me. And so we made a decision. We got home. I said, one of us going to have to do something and we can afford for one of us to quit. He said, yeah, the W2 speak for themselves. He yeah. said, I guess it's me. Yeah. And so for about a year, he worked from home. And then one night I came in from work and he had his whole system set up and all that. And I could hear them going, Ken, Ken, Ken. So I could hear them calling him, you know, cause he's working at home, <laughs> but he's not there at the desk. And so I hear this music coming out of the kitchen. I go in the kitchen, and my husband and the two kids at the time, they're in these matching jalapeno peppers aprons. <laughs> music is blasting. He has my daughter, he has her sitting on the counter. They're chopping up stuff. Anthony's grooving. They're making enchiladas for mommy. Yeah. So chopping up olives, doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And I said, what's going on? I said, hey. I said, are you working? I said, the people are calling you. He goes, no. 
I'm cooking dinner <laughs> and for the family, and we're making enchiladas. And so I tell people to this day, I don't know if he quit or they fired him, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because he should have been working, okay? And so he said that was the day yeah. he crossed over. He crossed because over. Because the kids were asking him what they were going to eat. They were hungry. He was working. He said all he thought about is, this is just like leaving them mm. at the daycare. I'm yeah. not paying attention to them. They're hungry. They're looking, you know, trying to get attention, and I just keep telling them to go away. He said he just finally just said, forget it. This yeah. is why I'm supposed I'm supposed to be home. Yeah. And he says, what do y'all want? And they said, let's make enchiladas. He goes, all right, let's cook for mommy. They yeah. went to the grocery store. They got the little matron aprons. They got everything. And he crossed over that night. And so a reporter asked him one time, they said, how is it being a stay-at-home dad? Because it was not easy. People would always say, well, what do you do? And yeah. what do you do? He said, I take care of my kids, and I take care of her, and I spend the money. And he just <laughs> laughing it off, right? But he said it was hard. He said, but he told this woman, and I actually couldn't believe he really said it because it was just so profound when I read it. He said, I don't know where that came from. He said, a real man will do whatever it takes for his family to thrive. Yeah. And when I read that, I said, wow. I said, you said that? He said, I did. He said, that is kind of profound. <laughs> he said, but that's, that's, that's what I feel. He said, whatever was necessary. Yeah. You know, because we worked hard and we prayed and cried for this family. He said, whatever it takes. Oh, okay. So go there. What? Okay, let's you go ready? Because I'm ready. I'm ready. You ready? Let's go there. Let's you go ready? Because I'm ready, Sid Marsha. I can feel it. Let's go Listen, there. Listen, you now. talk about you prayed and cried for this family. Yes. I mean, this book, I, I told you when we were talking off camera, I said, girl, I had to put it down because I had to say, Jesus. Yes. When Call I read the story. Mm. Because four second trimester miscarriages. Yes, four. You were trying for the first 10 years of your marriage yes. to have a child. Yes. I and kept you trying. were believing God for a yes. child, praying. I was believing God because, see, I had this plan. And so that's a joke, Ooh, right? Ain't that, okay. that, it's all, the it's joke, a joke is always our okay. plan. I had, joke. I had a plan. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, growing up poor, growing up in poverty, everybody had this big dream when I landed on Berkeley's campus. And so I had this dream, right? And so, I, you know, there are four words that I live by. Dream, focus, pray, act. So we had this big dream. I'm going to college. I'm on Berkeley's campus, you know, blazing trails. So I got to focus. So I focus. I literally, literally put Kenny on hold, my, my husband, yeah. for four years in yeah. college. Yeah. And I said, I will call you the day I graduate, okay? Because he had <laughs> moved to surprise me and all that. And the day I graduated, I yeah. called him. And he tried yeah. to act like he didn't know I was, said he was engaged and all that. But <laughs> anyway, we've been married 40 years now, okay? So... So I pop up, graduate. So we get me. So I had it all mapped out. Okay, I had it all mapped out. I was gonna go to school. I was gonna graduate, get married two years after graduating. Yeah. And then start a family two years after that. I had it all mapped out. Yeah. And it was going according to plan until it came time to have that family. Yeah. And when I after I had that first miscarriage, and then you're right, four second trimester miscarriages. So I had to go through everything, the nausea, all that, and I physically had to Give birth. deliver. Yes, yeah, so I deliver. Mean, I've had these babies laying on me that, you know, were not breathing. Yeah. And so just, you know, traumatic. So that's when the plan kind of, you know, came off the rails. And then I said, okay, this is going to be our fifth and final time. So we get pregnant the fifth time. And so, okay, this is it. And we didn't think there was anything in between. Either I was going to have another miscarriage at 16 and a half weeks or... I, I was going, you know, somewhere between 16, 18 weeks, or I was going to have a full-term pregnancy. And so we make it past the 16 weeks, the 18 weeks. We're yeah. like, okay, we're doing something now. Yeah. I get to 20 and a half weeks and my water breaks. I go into labor, you know, preterm labor. Get to the hospital. They got me upside down, just trying to stop the contractions and all that. They have me on magnesium for a week. And so I'm hallucinating and all that. And I just said, stop. Stop. This, this is just not working for me. I mean, it was all the drugs, and I just said, we're going to let the Lord do what he's doing. So I have Carolyn, uh, Carolyn with the K. Special K. Special K, because yeah. my, my mom's name is Carolyn. Yeah. And, of course, Kenny with the K. So Carolyn with the K. And so we have Special K, and they said Special K would live two days. And we're like, okay, so we're just going to let the Lord do what he's doing. Special K lives six and a half months. Yeah. And everything they said would kill her did not. Every week, every month, she was just going through something. But she was thriving. And we just said, you know what? 
if she gives up, we give up. I mean, we're, we're going with the Lord's plan. And one night we were there and they said, you know, Special K is making a lot of progress. They have found this um, procedure to do on her based on an article that I read. Yeah. Okay, so I'm in there advocating for my baby. And they said, I mean, she's doing well. The procedure is working. We didn't even know about this procedure. On and on and on. And I looked at her one night and I said, you know, I just want to just kind of see what's going on. I mean, something just didn't feel right. And they said, no, you can go home. You don't have to spend the night in the hospital anymore. So I went home, but I couldn't sleep. Four or five o'clock in the morning, I talked to the nurse and I said, Hi, how's my baby doing? And she said, she's looking great. We're, I mean, we're making plans for her to come home. Okay. So then I went to work. And then they called me. I was on a call that morning, actually facilitating our normal Friday morning call. And they said, uh, I said, something's not right. And so I called Janie and I said, her nurse, and I said, how's my baby doing? Like I, something just said, get off the call. And she goes, wait a minute. So then she came back and she said, uh, something's not right. Uh, the vitals don't look right. I rush to the hospital. We get there. And then for a few days, they just kept saying, no, nope, nope, nope. She's going to be okay. So here was my prayer. We spent the night at the hospital. And I said, Lord, my baby is gone. I know my baby is gone. I, I, could, I could just look at her and tell. And we always said we would fight until she fight. When she said, I'm tired. Yeah. And she's going to glory. We're saying, okay. And so I said, give these people a sign that my baby is gone. Because by this point, it's six and a half months. They are so attached to Special K. She's beautiful. They've lost a lot of babies in that NICU. Yeah. So this is like their baby. Okay? It's a champion. You're, yeah. You're a champion in, yes. the, in, in, the, in the whole NICU exactly. for all the other parents. Exactly. Yeah. So they're like, no, Special K is going to pull through. And so I said, Lord, give them a sign. So we slept at the hospital. Brandy, it was the first good night's sleep I got yeah. from the time I was pregnant. Yeah. I had such a sense of peace that I, we overslept. We were supposed to meet with the doctors yeah. that morning. I woke up. I'm like, ah, because, I mean, I just, I, had a, I just had a calmness. I had a peace about it. And so we called them and said, we're on our way over. So we get there. And so I'm thinking they're kind of upset because we're yeah. late. And they just stopped me. And they said, you can't go back and see her. I said, no, that's my baby. They said, you you can't see her. Something happened overnight. And I said, let me back here to my baby. And they were all crying. And so I get there and her head is huge. It's like twice the size that it was normally. And I said, what happened? They said she had a brain bleed. They said, there, there's, there's no brain activity. I already knew there was no brain activity. Yeah. And I had been asking for the test and all that. And they just kept delaying because they just didn't want to let the baby go. And so I just had to look up, and I kind of smiled, and I looked at my husband because my prayer the night before was, Lord, give them a sign yeah. that my baby is gone. So they were all crying. They got the sign and all that. And I said, um, they said, we've done the test. There's no brain activity. And then they said, but we might, if we unplug her, she could still live for a few more weeks. I said, my baby will be gone in a minute because she's already gone. Yeah. And so I said, so just let us go home and, you know, get her little clothes. We had this little white dress and all that for because somebody had given her, like, given us a christening yeah. outfit. So um, we went and we got all this stuff. I called my family. I said, you know, you guys want to, you know, watch Special K take her last breath. Uh, we're going to, you know, dress her all up and then um, that's going to be it. But they kept, the doctors kept saying, oh, no. The nurses were saying, no, she might end up in the ward, in the unit upstairs where, the babies sometimes go there because they keep breathing and all that. And I said, my baby will be gone in a minute. She's gone. I mean, she's, she's with the Lord. Yeah. And so I put her, we dressed her all up, just had her beautiful, and we put her in my husband's arms and in 59 seconds. Wow. 59 wow. 59 seconds. She took her last breath. Wow. And so laid her back down. You know, my husband's devastated, my sister and all that. And so we're walking out, and the nurses and the doctors asked me if I would stop and talk to the other parents. Yeah. Because they were so devastated because to your point, I mean, you know, she's like the, you know, she, she's making it. So then that gives everybody else hope. They said, can you talk to these other parents? And your family was livid. Oh. They were mad that they would ask you to do that. Ooh, Kenny cut up so bad. <laughs> okay. My sister cut up. And yeah. so I was telling her, take him out. She was like, my daughter is laying there dead. Yeah. She is laying there. Life is, I mean, he's going on and I'm telling her, take him out. Yeah. And you're asking us 
And they were like, well, we ain't really asking us. So we're asking her, okay? <laughs> like, like, you can go to the car, okay? <laughs> and so I just told him, I, because I, I understood. You knew, yeah. I understood what was going on, yeah. especially with these mothers in there. I understood. So my sister got him out, and I went around that room yeah, and talked to and prayed with all the people in that room. Uh, pray with the doctors and nurses to give them wisdom on what to do. I mean, so I was in there quite a while. Yeah. And then I went over there again and kissed my baby. And just she fought a good fight. But she, she, she ran her race and she finished her course. I mean, the part I told you, though, because you did a funeral. And the part I t that that just, it was like for a princess. It really was. My sister said she went to the cleaners because I had everybody in white. And he told her the men at the cleaners, he said, People are coming in here with these white dresses and stuff. He goes, uh, I think it's like somebody, some big dignitary, somebody's having a big <laughs> funeral on Friday. I don't know who it is. <laughs> my sister said she was kind of embarrassed. She says, well, it's my six-month-old niece. So we, like, <laughs> he, he really thought it was like somebody being right. And so she says, well, it's my six-month-old niece. But, I mean, we're going to like put her away in style. And so when I was at the funeral home, in fact, the guy who took my baby from the hospital, he said, so remember she went from this yeah, big head and yeah. all that, and he said it was the most beautiful baby he had ever seen. Because after the Lord, like, revealed his sign, then her head went, went back, back down. In fact, one of my friends said, Sent, she sent me a note later, and she said, Sent, what was the significance of the porcelain doll in the casket? I said, girl, that wasn't a porcelain doll in the casket. That was my baby. Wow. I mean, she was beautiful. And so... When we were at the funeral home, the guy was trying to tell us to get some little cheap casket or whatever. Ever. I said, no, no, I want that little golden white casket. He said, well, I mean, it's just a baby. I said, special K. Yeah. It's a princess. And so we're at the funeral, and people are walking around to give their condolences, and my husband just couldn't take it. He couldn't take it. He says, why are these people talking to us? Why are we on the front row? What is going on here? The casket is there. He just truly couldn't take it. Yeah. But we had a service like you wouldn't believe. Yeah, because I wanted people to know the, the Lord did this thing. Mm. And n not only did he grant me my desire to have this child, she didn't, you know, live too long. But he also showed up in our grief and he had people around us. I mean, we looked around that room and saw who was in there. And that was just a sign that like for the rest of our lives, the pe these people would show up for us and we would show up for them. And it was real clear to me because we had said this is the fifth and final time that the Lord had another way to make my family. Yeah. And he did. And then we got on the adoption um, train. And now I have four beautiful adoption. But adopt you, kids. Don't, don't say it like that, Sin, because okay. you didn't go on that adoption train willingly. Well, no, I yeah. did. I cut up. And he had to, <laughs> yes, okay, you did your homework. The boy had to throw me in the truck. He had to throw you make in the me truck. go to the meeting. Yeah, okay? your husband, he had to throw you in the truck. Because I didn't want to go, okay? Yeah. So I was grieving. I was grieving yeah. the way I wanted to grieve. Yeah. And so I turned into a, a workaholic. Like, that is truly when I turned into a workaholic because up until then I remember the days and I tell this story to some of my people now and they can't believe it. Cause I do work a lot. When my husband bought me a briefcase when we first got married and I was an engineer for the company and I said, what's that for? And he said, you know, when you have to take work back and forth, I said, I'm, I, I don't need to take work back and forth. When I go to work, I work. <laughs> when I come home, I come home. I said, the only thing I'm putting in there is my Bible. Okay. Yeah. I can read it on the, you know, public transportation out, whatever, but no work. And now I drag my work home, like in a whole little suitcase and all that. Yeah. So, so I was, but I turned into a workaholic at that point. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, I just poured myself into it. And so one night I came home and he said, oh, we're going to go to an adoption meeting. And I said, I already told you, I'm not going to an adoption meeting. I'm not dealing with any bureaucracy. I've already dealt with a lot of stuff yeah. in children's hospital. I'm not yeah. doing any of that. Yeah. They can leave me a baby on my doorstep. Okay, just pay them whatever they, the fee is, whatever. Just leave the baby on the doorstep. They don't even have to have any clothes. I love to shop. I get the baby some clothes. Just leave the baby on the doorstep. I'm not, deal, I'm not dealing with any of that. I'm yeah. not filling out any papers. I'm not just, I just, I've had enough. I was grieving so hard. He physically picked me up and put me in his truck. He said, all right. He said, I hate to do this. He picked me up, put me in the truck. He said, we are going to an adoption meeting. He said, I already talked to the people. We get to the meeting. We're late because I don't want to be there. And the social worker said, when they got there, they said, oh, she looks like she doesn't want to be here. And, you know, I'm a happy, 
person. So right? you was you had black mama attitude. Oh, all, lightweight all attitude. It you might not even been light. Okay, <laughs> I come in with an attitude and I look, and it was only two seats in the front row. I mean, the front row. And my husband said, "Okay." He says, "Looks like we need to sit up there." I said, "I'm not going all the way up there." He just grabbed my hand, took me all up to the front. Two show, social workers said they saw us come in, and so one of them said. That guy looks like he could be Anthony Young's dad. So Anthony Young was this little boy, two years old, well, two and a half years old, had been left in a, uh, born in a bathtub, abandoned when he was nine months old with his nine-year-old brother taking care of him. I mean, just a sad story. Mom went to jail. She didn't tell anybody. And so they said, nope, it's too late, because they had just came up with a permanent plan for him and left the file for the judge to sign off the next morning. You hear me? The next morning yeah. to put him in a long-term group home situation. Now that sounds sad for a two and a half year old boy to go into a group home, but it was the best permanent solution for him at the time because they didn't have any prospective parents. And so one of the social workers said, what do you think? You think they're interested in a two year old black boy? And she said, nope. Nope, because people want girls, they want infants. Nope, not not possible. She says, but he's kind of looked like him. She says, nope. So the meeting goes on, and I guess I must have been kind of grumbling a little bit because when it got to the part where they wanted us to fill out the papers, yeah, yeah. I said, um, I told my husband, I said, I tell you, I'm not filling out any papers. I'm not doing all this. I yeah. said, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. So the guy apparently heard me, and he said, and if you don't want to fill out the papers, then just write in, put your name down and write in the upper right hand corner what kind of kid you're interested in. Now, keep in mind the story I just told you about the social workers. I don't know any of that. Yeah. I don't even know these social workers are standing behind me because yeah. somehow they made their way up to us. Yeah. And so I wrote my name and I put in the corner two year old black boy. Literally, this hand reaches over, she snatches, I look at her. And I'm like, what is going on here? And she says, are you really interested in a two-year-old black boy? Now, of course, I don't want to be there. I have this lightweight attitude. I said, no, I just, I just made it up. I just <laughs> wrote it down. And then I started crying. Mm. And so my husband got emotional, and he said, yes, we're interested in a two-year-old boy because we just lost an infant girl. So we lost our daughter August 21st, and this was the beginning of October. So it had just been, you know, less yeah, than two months. two months. And so... He said, so that's why. I mean, we don't even want to pretend like we're trying to replace her. And then I said, and if I'm going to adopt, they're going to be old enough to go to school and then I daycare and then I don't have to stay home with them. And I yeah. keep doing my executive thing, right? Yeah. And so we laughed about it. The next day, the next day, we got a call because, of course, they went back and retrieved that file from the, from judges. the judge's desk. Yeah. And we met the little honey. And the rest is history. Yeah. He's my 31 year old. Yeah. And then he picked both of his sisters off television. One was a Wednesday child in the San Francisco news. And then he saw one on a PBS special in North Carolina 10 years later. And then we also learned about his brother who was nine when they were abandoned. We learned about him when he was 14 living right around the corner from my mother and going to the high school the that my school mother that was your in mother the same office. Worked in the office. Overnight he had a grandma. In his, in the you got to tell our audience because, like, people will not, when we say, like, God is real. He's so real. When we say God is real. He's real. Like, when I was reading this story and the story of Anthony and then Ricky. Yes. How Ricky comes into the picture of your family. Yes. I need these because because this is when you know if you are not a believer in the divine power of God, mm. baby. He shows up. He shows up. And he showed up. So we get this call. It's two days after Christmas. And Anthony had a little play date with one of his friends. But we get this call from the social worker telling us that their birth mom had passed away. And they wanted to know if, number one, they wanted to test Anthony. Because uh, she passed away of HIV. Yes. Yeah. So they wanted to test him. And he turned out to be fine. But they didn't know when she contracted and all that. So they wanted to test him. But more importantly for them, and this is what they said, they said, but more importantly, we want to know if you will give us some pictures of Anthony because we have to break the news to his brother, who is 14 now. 
he took it hard because, of course, he was there, you know, yeah. with his mom and all that. So he took it hard and he asked whatever happened to his little brother that he had only seen him one time since the police found them and separated them into two different, you know, foster care tracks. And so we said, OK. And they said, well, can we come by and get some pictures? Because they just thought maybe that would ease the pain. And so my husband said, well, well where is the young man? I mean, we'll take Anthony to see him. Obviously, we'll vet it first, yeah. but we'll take Anthony to see him. So we took Anthony on his little play date. And back then, I was taking a lot of pictures. Okay, so I had all these photo albums. You know, I kind of felt sorry for, like, my last one that we adopted because, like, I only have just probably, like, one or two little photo <laughs> albums. But by that point, I had so many little photos. Because, you know, it was my first one. Yeah, right? yeah. So my first one I was able to bring home. So we go and we uh, visit with the foster mother, and she was very protective, which is great. And so we told her the social workers had called us, blah, blah, blah. So we wanted to meet Ricky, and we we're going to show him some pictures of Anthony. Ricky comes out. We, we met him. He comes out looking just like Anthony. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And we're like, whoa. And so then he's looking at the photo albums. He got so emotional. He asked if he could take the books in the back room because he was with his other brothers there, yeah. you know, his foster brothers. And you could hear him in the back literally looking at pictures. And he was saying stuff like, this is when we went to Disneyland. And this is when we, I mean, he put himself into these pictures. Wow. He's, and he's back there talking to them. He's crying. At this point, we're all in this woman's living room. We're crying. And we just told her, we said, we would like to reunite them tonight. So she says, yes, please. She was apprehensive at first. But then after all this happened, she's like, that would be a great idea. So when he came back out, we said, honey, would you, would you like to see your brother? Would you like to see him tonight? And he says, are you kidding me? And we said, we're going to take you to see him. So I called the people and I said, we're coming to pick up Anthony, but we're going to have his brother. And he and we had told him we were going to see his brother. And he said, my cousin, my, yeah, cousin, my cousen, yeah. because, you know, I have five sisters and brothers. My husband is from a family of six. So we have all these nieces and nephews. Yeah. And he says, no, my husband would not let him do that. I said, well, he doesn't understand. So let him just say cousin. He said, no, that's his brother. That's his brother. I need him to know that's his brother. I need him to know that boy saved his life. I mean, I need him to know. So I called the people and I said, we're going to come and we're, his brother is going to ring the doorbell. Can you have Anthony open the door? We pull up, Anthony gets, I mean, Ricky gets out the car. And so we're still, we're standing outside the car, but we're watching this scene and I can still see it. Anthony opened that door. Ricky reached down because, of course, Ricky recognizes him. Yeah. Anthony didn't really recognize him that much, I think, until he held him. Yeah. And then Anthony started squeezing on him. He started squeezing on uh, Ricky. I mean, the whole thing was just beautiful. Wow. They were crying. We were crying. So then we took him out. I said, okay, I said, honey, what you want to eat? Ricky said he wanted some pizza. We took him to the pizza parlor. They've got all these video games in this big car, right? So Ricky is down on his hands and knees doing the pedals while Anthony is driving. So I went over there in my mommy mode, <laughs> and I said, sweetheart, I said, you don't have to do the pedals for him. He knows how to do this. He's taking advantage of the situation. Huh? My husband came and got me. He said, <laughs> get out of that. He said, don't you see what's happening? He is picking up where he, he left, left off. off. The last time he saw him, he was taking care of that boy. And by that point, when he was 11 months old, let him pick up where he left off. I said, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so I backed out of it, and I watched these honeys just reunite and bond. And then right after that, we were adopting Shirley. And then they start fighting over whose brother was Ricky and all that. So, I mean, literally, the Lord just, he just made my family. Yeah. He showed up. He In showed a way up. that you did not expect. I said, I got, I said, you know what? He took, he took those honeys away from me. And he actually, you know how Job got double for his trouble? Yeah. I got quadruple. Quadruple. For yeah. my trouble. Yeah, you did. Yes, I did. Yeah, you did. He shows up. Yeah. That's the story of my life. He always shows up. Let me tell you, though, because you and Kenny, <laughs> you and Kenny child, I said, I want to love like Kenny. OK, yes, yes. I want I want how Kenny love on, on Miss yes, over yes. here. He's honey. Good. I got to have that. He's precious. But, Lord, the devil tried to take him a few times. You know, he had that brain damage. Listen, except they all have brain damage. But he like had some serious brain damage. <laughs> <laughs> the story that you tell in the book about he gets this virus that he gets something from the daycare from daycare, from, from daycare. right it's a daycare virus and it, he comes home right 
And things just start to spiral yes. after that. It got really bad. They put us all, and we all had, you know, we we're all sick. They put us on medication, but my husband was allergic to this sulfur medication. They took him off the medication, but they didn't put him on anything else. They just figured the virus would go away. And it didn't. So I ran into work one day. I said, just let me go in real quick. And then I came back in. I called him. And I said, what do you want to eat? And, you know, trying to eat healthy and all that. He said, I'm tired of eating healthy. I'm tired of this soup. I want a chili cheese dog. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I stop and I get him a chili cheese dog. I come in and I'm get, and he's trying to he's trying to talk to me, but he doesn't realize his whole face had twisted. So I came in and I saw him and I threw the bag up. Yeah. And he's trying to figure out why am I throwing away his chili dogs. Yeah. So he's trying to say something about his chili dogs and his fries. And I'm just looking at him. I'm like, you got a problem. He's I mean, he's had a stroke. Like something's going on. Yeah. Okay, don't ask me why I didn't call the ambulance. Okay. I told my niece to watch Anthony, and I ended up, same kind of thing, I put him up in the big truck and took him to the hospital. I said, I just got to help him get him to the hospital. Should have called the ambulance. Didn't think that way because, you know, yeah. I'm just in a panic. Yeah. So I get him, and then they get there, and they can't figure out what's going on with him. Young doctor, he said, I think it's viral encephalitis, but he doesn't have, like, all the signs. So I don't really know. I mean, just we just got to let this play out, some kind of virus. Yeah. And so we go through that for a few days and then it just wouldn't get any better. And so finally we took him to another hospital and I just demanded to see the neurologist, the top neurologist. And they did ended up diagnosing him with that first diagnosis yeah. from that emergency yeah. room uh, doctor as viral encephalitis. And so uh, the virus went to his brain and my husband literally ended up in a rehab hospital and had to learn how to walk and talk all over again. They said we would have to redo the house, so we got bars in the house. I mean, he, he was in bad you, shape. You were setting this up for this to be a handicapped yes. household. Yes. For him to be able to have a wheelchair. Oh, yes, we had the rail. You were I mean, setting he couldn't this up. walk or talk. Yeah. I mean, he just lost everything. And so then I just said, you know what? And so it was around the time we always go to a church convention. So every August, we were part of a big church organization, and we'd go to the church convention. That's where... You know, people go on vacation. That was our vacation. Yeah. And yeah. so I said, you know what? I got to go. He's in the hospital, right? I said, but I, I, I got to go. I, I, I need this church meeting. Yeah. So it's not even just about my new outfits and my big hat. I need a miracle. Yeah. And so I said, and all I could think about is those early mornings where it'd be all the, the, the women and the missionaries and the mothers in white, all the preachers up yeah. there. And we would just, I mean, it would be like 10,000 of us yeah. just entreating the Lord. And yeah. I said, and you know, you see people go up and the prayer requests and all that. Unfortunately for me, I never had like any big prayer requests. I said, I'm going to be one of those people. Going yeah. And they're now saying, I need a miracle. Yeah. And so we go to the church convention and the, you know, the doctors met with me before then. And yeah. they even got their ethicists involved because they said, you cannot leave and go uh, to the Carolinas. You can't do that because your husband might not be here when you get back. Do you realize how sick he is? You got your niece there who was, was watching. His parents are supposed to come. They're supposed to come. But then the mom, his mother, says, I can't see my son in that state and turns back around. Yes. And leaves him at the house with yes. your niece. She said it's, she just she couldn't do it. She said yeah. she just couldn't do it. And, and he was still in the hospital. So my niece, okay, so my sister was with me. Yeah. So my niece's dad, okay, so my brother-in-law, he was, you know, going, back, going and back and forth and taking Janelle, my niece, to go in there and all that. And so I called one day. I said, well, where, where are my in-laws? I said, well, where's, where are my in-laws? And Janelle said, Auntie, they didn't come. And then we, and I called my mother-in-law, and she just, she was crying. She said, I can't see him like that. And I understand that. Yeah. Uh, she passed away, her, and her name is Shirley. So my baby yeah. Shirley is named yeah, after yeah. my mother-in-law. And she said, I, can, I can't see him like that. And so I said, okay. And so, but, you know, we didn't know. And so I said, okay. I said, we also, then I talked to Janelle's dad. I said, but I can't leave until I get my, my miracle. miracle. And so I'd go every morning. We would pray all these people. We didn't treat the Lord and all that. And so one day I called, and it's three days into the trip, okay? Because we know in three days. Three days. Things happen. You okay? was praying for three days. Three days. Three days. So I call on the third day, and I said, um, how's my husband doing? And they said, we can't find him. I said, what do you mean you can't find him? And they said, we don't know where he is. Can you tell us where he is? I said, no, I'm a few thousand miles away because he's <laughs> in the hospital in Berkeley, California. I said, I'm <laughs> I'm a few thousand miles away. Y'all need to find my husband. Like, <laughs> this is not funny. Is this some yeah. kind of joke? And so then they put somebody else in the phone and they said, Mr. Marshall, we can't find him. 
And I said, okay, y'all got about five minutes to find my husband. Because, like, I left him there in that hospital. I'm going to cut up. I'm okay, I left up. him there yeah. in that hospital. Yeah. I've been calling here. This is the third yeah. day. Like, where is he? And so when we find, here's where they found him. He said he got up. He woke up that morning. And something just said, get up and walk. Get up and walk. He said he got up. Okay, so th- th- this is just how he is, though. He got up, he said, and he could walk. He walked to the elevator. He saw a wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> we still laugh about that. He saw a wheelchair and decided to get in the wheelchair. Now, the boy's walking, okay? But he got in the wheelchair. He said he went to the elevator, and he rolled into the wheelchair. And when I, because he hadn't been outside. He said that he went and sat outside and was soaking in the rays and all yeah. that. He said, now, he didn't know he could also talk until all these people, the nurses, everybody, I guess they found him, right? Yeah. And they start running at him, and he said, oh, my wife must be looking for me. <laughs> he said that's when he actually realized he could talk. So by the time I called back, he answered the phone. Wow. And it's a Lord, so I literally, I packed up. I told my mom. I said, okay, we're leaving because I, I had Anthony with me. I said, I got my miracle. The hotel is paid for. Y'all enjoy it because, you know, eight-day church convention. I said, y'all enjoy the rest of the church convention. I got my miracle. And I went on home and packed that boy up and took him back. And so the doctor said he was like 85%, 85, 90% back to normal. I said, that's less brain damage than he had when I married him. I'll take him, okay? And so I will take him. And so God showed up. He worked that miracle. He worked that miracle because he always shows up i mean sin like literally when i read this i was like oh my <laughs> come on three days <laughs> three days come on three, three days. days okay that's where, why you he, where is he he's not in the tomb that's he, right he's not in his room <laughs> tell me where the body lies okay <laughs> listen he's not in the room that's okay right. oh, three days uh, he's outside sitting in a wheelchair soaking up the sun Listen, Until they came to find him. Because you were like, I got to get away from this. I had to. I got to go somewhere else. to focus. So I can focus in on what I know God has for me. Because he did not bring us this far no. to leave us right here. Right. I said, we just adopted this little boy. I mean, he no, no. This is not, I don't believe this is the plan. Now, it could have been. I didn't yeah. believe yeah. that was the yeah. plan yeah. for us. Yeah. Not the way the Lord had been orchestrating and yeah. everything that was happening. I said, this is another test of my faith. Yeah. Just like when my daughter died. Because when, I mean, when she died and all that, and we talked about it before, I had that casket in my lap because I just said, you know, I brought this baby into this world. I carried her in here. I'm going to carry her out. Yeah. And one of my pastors one time, he said, I mean, my pastor, he put his head in the car and he saw the casket. Cause, you know, we we're all leaving to go to the cemetery and he saw the casket in my lap. And, you know, Kenny was sitting there and Kenny just said, just like, OK, that's fine. You want to carry it. You know, just don't open it. I mean, it was just too much for him. Right. Because I'm like, I'm carrying my baby out of this world and oh, just cutting up. My pastor said he saw that and he went and told his wife. He said, you know what? Sin is OK. She said, how she's doing? How's she doing? And she said, she's OK. She said she he said she is sitting there with that casket in her lap because, you know, all the, you know, everybody's lining up behind us yeah. to go to cemetery. And he said his wife, who's a good friend of mine, Dora, said, Sin has the casket in her lap. And she said, he said, yeah, she's doing all right. Dora said, she's not she's all right. not all right. She's not all right. Yeah. If she has that casket in her lap, Sin is grieving. We got to pray. We got to look out for her. She is not all right. So we go, we have the service at the cemetery. I go home. Kenny said he wanted to go see his parents. He said, let's just go to Fresno, yeah. like three hours away. I said, I don't want to go to Fresno. It's been a long week. You know, she died on a Sunday. We buried her on a Friday. I mean, I spent all that week planning and all that. I said, I just, I just want to go to bed. Yeah. He said, well, I really want to go and see my parents. And he just wanted to get out of the house. Yeah. I said, okay. So I said, I, I'll be okay. So he left, pulled out. I'm going up the stairs, Brandy. And I'm going up the stairs to go to our bedroom, but to the left was her nursery that she never saw. Yeah. And I look over at the nursery and it's Minnie Mouse stuff, just everything, right? And just glancing at it, I just fell over on the staircase. That was on a Friday. My husband came home that Sunday evening and I was still laying on their staircase. Yeah. I cried, cried, cried. You're talking about grieving. Doris was right. I was not okay. 
When Kenny came in, he realized I still had the same clothes on that I had never made it upstairs. And I tell you this story because this is how God shows up. And this is how I look at my life. Kenny's hand reached down to get me, which is just what the Lord does. And he didn't say a word. He just pulled me up, took me to the bedroom. And then the healing started after that. And that's how God does. Like his, he will, and he uses people. We're those people that he uses. It's our hands. Yeah. To help get people up. Yeah. Or to, you take your hand and somebody else will pull you up. And I always think about that moment when I'm going through something or when somebody else is going through something, it's like, okay, I need to be that hand right now. Yeah. Yeah. Or Lord, like, where's that hand coming from? Because I need to get up. Yeah. But he's shown me time and time again, he will always get me up. He brings you up and Kenny just got me up. And, and that's when he said, he thought I'm going to have to do something. And that's when he started making his secret calls and yeah. all that for a few weeks yeah. on the whole adoption process. He said, when he took me upstairs and put me in the bed, he said, okay, we got to do something different. Number one, we're not trying this again. Even if she wants to change her mind, yeah. we got to do something different. Cause he had been one, wanting to adopt since the first miscarriage. Yeah. And so the Lord showed up and, and then, I got four of them monsters. And, and then his hand, then your hand shows up yes. in him to pull him up. And yes. let me go pray for you because I got to get up us up out of here. And that's how my hand is going to show up. Right. And it's showing yeah. up. And it's showing yeah. up. I mean, it's showing up now. Yeah. You know, he's going through his cancer battle right now. Yeah. You said that your husband has been diagnosed <sighs> with cancer. And so when they told him that on August the 4th, he couldn't believe it. And the doctor told him he has multiple myeloma, blood cancer, stage one. And he said, uh, he just looked, he was in shock, just like I was. He was having an out-of-body experience. Because the, we didn't even get the fact that you are a cancer survivor. Oh, yeah. Stage three, colon Stage cancer. Stage three, colon cancer. Yeah. Because I did not handle my business. I did not have a colonoscopy when I should have. But I still, I had it my last day of 50, but I should have had it before then. And ignored the signs and all that. And by the time I got diagnosed, I had stage 3C colon cancer, one lymph node away from stage 4, cancer in my lymph nodes, blood vessels, all that. And I ended up with six months of brutal chemotherapy. And you're talking about people showing up. Yeah. It was intense. So bad prognosis and all that, but that was, what, 13 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. So God showed up. Again, and yeah. that's what really I took my journal because I actually wrote a cancer journal. So every round of chemo, so all 12 yeah. rounds, yeah. you know, I would write something that I talk about what I learned and all yeah. that. Right. And so my book was just supposed to be that journal. I told the people, this is a masterpiece. If y'all want a book from me, because somebody <laughs> called me about writing a book. I said, well, if you want a book for me, it's going to be about my cancer journey. They said, no, 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 no. We don't want to talk about your cancer journey. Uh, that's fine. But we want the leadership book. We want the executive book. I said, no, no, no. The Lord let me know if I ever wrote a book, it would be about this cancer story. I want to reach out to people that are touched by cancer because either you have it or you know somebody that have it. There's so much that goes My mom through. is a breast cancer survivor. See? Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. She made it. Yeah. And so, uh, and so people would call and ask me for this journal. And so one time one of my assistants, she bound it up real pretty. She said, Sin, you really do need to turn this into a book. So here's my opportunity to turn it into a book. But in talking to me and the ghostwriter yeah. working with me, they said, you've been chosen for so much more than just this cancer journey. Yeah. And they talked about all these other things we've been talking about. And they said, put it in the book. So I actually like put it in the book. So, of course, as you've been chosen. So when Kenny got his diagnosis and he's in his state of shock, his out of body experience, like I was when the doctor told me, I looked at him and I said, boy, you've been chosen. You've been chosen. And he smiled and he says, Well, dang, I guess so. He didn't say dang. He said something else. But (laughs) (laughs) And so then the doctor started laughing. I mean, so we're laughing. And the doctor is looking at us like, what's wrong with these people? I just told this man. He's got cancer. He's got cancer. Yeah. And so then I had to tell her what you've been chosen was all about. Because truly, that's what I believe, that I've been chosen. I was chosen for the class of 2011. And now he is chosen for the class of 23, 24. And so we started laughing. And so then when I told her the story, she looked at him and she, when we, we got ready to leave, she says, Ken, you've been chosen. So that's our big thing now is this is like you've been chosen part two. Yeah. And so we're going through it, chemo every week and all that. He'll have a bone marrow transplant uh, in about five weeks. And so he'll make it. He'll make yeah. it. Yeah. How do you keep renewing your faith? Because I have receipts. 
Hmm. I have receipts. Yeah. I have so many times that I can talk about where he showed up. Yeah. So I am like the last person to lose hope because he, sh- he, he always shows up. Yeah. Good people and God, they, but in the reverse order, they yeah. always shows up because he uses us. Yeah. He uses us. It's like he is using you and your platform to lift him up, to let people know he is real and yeah. to have faith. And you're lifting up uh, the stories of, of all people, but especially people uh, like us. He has a way to show up and show out all the time. Yeah. And so if he uses me, uses you, uses others to do that, we let him show up and we show out. And sometimes I just say, Lord, because even like with my kids, sometimes I'll just say, okay, Lord, I need you to bring them through this. My prayer is that, you know, I've given these kids a math book and a Bible, right? <laughs> and so I just want them to live for you. And, you know, so I got my whole little prayer. And then I say, okay, Lord, so you bring them to the foot of the cross and you give me the strength to endure however you bring them. Yeah. You bring them the easy, some will come the easy way, some will come the hard way. Yeah. But I know you will show up, you bring them because he always shows up. And so that's what I rely on. Yes, I am resilient. Yes, I'm naturally an optimistic person. Yes, I have a lot of hope and I have faith in God, faith in humanity, but I also have receipts. Hmm. He has showed up in my life because I've been chosen. Yeah. And you've been chosen. Absolutely. First black woman to be CEO of an NBA team in 2018. Crazy. That's a couple years ago. Yes. You know, when we think we've come far, baby, this is... you, you. God sent you to a, a curveball. Yeah. He did. And you know what? I didn't even know I was the first black woman to do this until I was doing an actual national TV broadcast. And the guy asked me, how was it being the first black woman to hold this position? And I actually didn't believe him. Hmm. I said, oh, no, no. And by then it was 2019. I said, it's 2019. There's no way in the world I'm first in yeah. 2019. And he goes, no, you're first. And, I, and right there on TV, I had to just stop and think about it. I said, okay, well, I think that's a shame. Yeah. I said, but then I won't be the last. Yeah. I said, I won't be the last. We'll work on the pipeline. I'll do a good job, all that. And I would tell you, when my boss, when Mark Cuban selected me for this job, he didn't know that either. Yeah. Never crossed his mind because that's just not how we think. He was looking for who he thought was the most qualified person for the situation at hand to lead his organization. Yeah. But when I do find out I'm the first, I'm like, okay. I got to make sure I do a great job. But you had to come out of retirement to be the first. Yeah, I came out of retirement. They, they I mean, to get I had, you off the bench. I had worked hard. <laughs> I had retired and said I was going to take a year off. Yeah. Started my consulting company and all that. Got that call from Mark, who I did not know. And Listen, she I did not know, know him. She said, who, who was that? Well, I didn't know your him. Husband, but he didn't know husband, me. Your he had to make me call him. <laughs> he called my son and said, help me convince your mother to call this man back. Wow. I'm like, why do I need to call him back? And so I didn't know what was going on. So when I talked to him, we ended up having a wonderful conversation. Yeah. Except I could not meet with him at the time he wanted to meet with me. Because? Because I told him I can't meet with you at 2 o'clock because I have a mammogram schedule. Yeah. He said, okay. I said, and I learned the hard way what happens when you don't take care of your medical business. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm a cancer survivor. So I got to go to my mammogram. Yeah. So I ended up going to him at 4 o'clock and we had a great meeting. And my, the, my husband was all excited because we were going to meet Mark Cuban. I came home from the mammogram. He was all decked out in maths, in colors. Blue. Oh, my goodness. I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, no, these are the colors. These are the maths colors. He said, you can't go in there because I went to Berkeley, right? Yeah. No Berkeley blue. No Golden State Warriors blue. I'm from the Bay Area, right? He goes, no, Mavs blue. And so I guess he had FaceTime with my son. He goes, and you have it in the closet. So I'm like, oh, God. He meant for me to show up right yeah, And so Mark and I had a good meeting. He was as sincere as he could be about wanting to create a different environment and a different, yeah, culture, different culture and a great yeah. place to work yeah. for his folks. So we got on a journey. We laid out a vision. We laid out a vision, a set of values, met with all the employees. He gave me all the support uh, that I needed, all the resources that I needed. I love, love, love Mark Cuban. Yeah. And so we did what we needed to do. We've been on a journey together with all these people. Since to, uh, 2018. Since 2018. But we're doing some, it. There were some people who said you wouldn't last 90 days. He, yeah, that man did say that. Because, you know, I was having all these one-on-ones with all yeah. the employees. And I could just tell some were just holding back. And we had all these initiatives we were working on, you know, collectively, right? Yeah. We're all like, yeah. okay, this is our workplace. We're going to get this stuff done. And we're allowed to put in place. 
And one of them just said, you know what? We're all in except our boss said to ignore this whole plan that you will be gone in 90 days because this is a publicity stunt by wow. Mark Cuban. Wow. And we're like, what? Why, why would he, he? First of all, he wouldn't even do anything like that. Yeah. And so I called the guy in and I said, you know, he reported directly to me. I said, and we had, all, you know, we had already had to let a few people go. And I said, what is going on here? Did you really like tell your people that? He said, yeah, I did. And he was very, and I love this guy. I mean, he was very honest about it. That's just what he thought. He said, there's just no way a woman, let alone a black woman, you don't know basketball. Hmm. And I, you know, I love sports. I ran track. Yeah. I love basketball. Yeah. But I, mean, I, don't, I didn't know the business of basketball. Yeah. And that was a big thing. I did not know the business of basketball. But Mark was looking for a leader. He said, we'll teach you the business of basketball. And he did. And my other colleagues did too. And so I said, no, it's not a publicity stunt. I came out of retirement and I'm committed and I'm going to do this. I'm falling in love with these people. Like we're going yeah. to do this. I mean, we, we owe it to these people to give them a great place to work and we're going to diversify the place in the process. Yeah. And this is going to, we're going to get this done. And, but he confessed and he was honest. And so, you know, wonderful man. And, but he, had, he had a lot of issues too. Yeah. And a lot of things came up. And so, uh, you know, we handled that. You still here. He's gone. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Correct. <laughs> and you know, when people have kids and all that, it's like, I don't really talk about it. Cause I'm like, you know, you don't want your families getting all caught up in that. Yeah. So you just graciously let people exit. Sometimes people just aren't a good fit yeah. for the current culture. They're not yeah. a good fit for what you're yeah. trying to get done. And you just figure out how to graciously uh, deal with all that because all these people have lives. They all have livelihoods. Uh, but also there's, there's something, we have some standards yeah. and we have some values and so yeah. every now and then it just doesn't align. Yeah. And in that situation, it didn't align. Yeah. And, but we graciously handled it. And I think everybody was happy when it was all said and done with. Yeah. So we had, we had a lot of changes to make. We had, yeah. we had a lot to do and we did it. And we have a fabulous, fabulous, uh, employee body, great fans, great community people. We've you've stepped up, up our amount, game. You've up the amount of women, the amount of women that work for the company now. 50% my leadership team, because I tell them it starts with From me. The, yeah. the tone is set at the top. And then my expectation is that the tables below me look like my table. And so that's the journey. You work on that journey. You don't yeah. get there overnight. Uh, but my leadership team, uh, when I got there, uh, they didn't have any permanent, you know, any women in permanent leadership, leadership positions. Position. They had one you know, temporary. Um, and, but it was 10 white men uh, sitting at the table in my first staff meeting. And so my leadership team now is 50% women, 50% men, 50% people of color, 50% white. Yeah. And so it's a good group of people. And so when we talk about diversity and all that, that just doesn't mean black people or brown yeah. people. It means all of us. Yeah. I mean, including white people, yellow people, brown people. It's all of us yeah. working together. And yeah. so uh, our workplace promise is every voice matters and everybody belongs. And so we just try to work hard at that. And we don't get it right every day, uh, but we work really hard at it. I mean, it's, this is a platform that we have. We have the best platform to raise issues. People trust us. They, they gather at our uh, facility, 20,000 people. They get excited about stuff so we can gather them then, but we can also gather them when things happen. Yeah. And so that's what we did. We've had courageous conversations. We've put some real kind of world issues uh, in front of the commu community, yeah, yeah. Cause I'm gonna, we're going to use the platform that way. Yeah. And my boss, I mean, Mark Cuban, he, he's, he's big on that. He's like, yeah. let's use this platform. Uh, so we had some courageous conversations the summer of 2020 when George Floyd was killed. And with, with COVID out there, we talked about health disparities. So we started Mavs Take Action. And so series of initiatives where we put a lot of money into the community, a lot of money into issues. We use our platform uh, to talk about things. In fact, we just had a little gathering where we brought some community folks together to talk about our three-year Mavs Take Action plan and what all we accomplished. And then we just teed up Mavs Take Action for the next few years. Wow. Because that's what you do with your platforms. Yeah. And it's for everybody. It's for everybody. Courageous conversations. Yes. What's next for St. Marshall? What word are you living by? What are you committed to in this season of your life? Okay, so every year I pick a word or a phrase. Me too. Okay, so this year it is Seize the Moment. Ooh, And good. I just took over as the chair of the Dallas Regional Chamber, uh, the board. Okay, so another first, right? Wow. And so they asked me to do it, and I said, okay. 
I'll do it. I was the chair of the board for Dallas CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates, because, you know, I'm all about permanence and stability for these kids. For children, yeah. And so these kids who are in foster care, making sure they have advocates yeah. and all that. So I did that. So it timed out at the end of December. And it just so happened. The chamber <laughs> called and said, can you do this? So you right? got you a new, another job. I said, okay, so <laughs> I'm doing it. But it's great because uh, it's a great moment in time for Dallas. We have a lot of resources. We have a lot of companies moving there. I mean, just the region is booming. But we still have the tale of two cities. And so our our CEO of the chamber talks about how he can be in one zip code and the life expectancy is 85 years. And then he can go to two zip codes away and the life expectancy is 58 years old. Wow. Literally because of health disparities and things that are happening. You go from affluence to poverty. And we said we shouldn't have that in Dallas because we just have too many resources and it's such a great region and it's a very inclusive place. We've worked very hard for everybody to work together. And so my speech last week was seize the moment. And I gave them five different areas where we have to seize the moment around education. And it's all about closing those gaps around education, around health disparities, yeah. around inclusion and all that. And so that's, that's what I'm about right now. Seize Seizing the moment. the moment, not just passively addressing some of this yeah but to seize this moment of time that we are in especially in dallas it's a good time for us to truly make a difference truly make a difference like seize the moment to really educate uh these kids we have so much uh so much richness around so many smart people so much technology let's make sure that that's in the hands of all of our children so a seizing the moments to truly make a difference so when i describe my f future i call it three b's Books, boards, and better. So I will write another book, uh, either on leadership. Well, I'll probably write one on leadership, one on parenting, because I got all kind of you know yeah. advice around raising teenagers yeah. and all kind of stuff, yeah. right? Uh, so I'll do that at some point in time. Yeah. Um, not until you know I have more time on my hands, uh, because I haven't even been able to really do a tour in this book because you know, I got a job. Yeah. I got a job. So thank you for like <laughs> highlighting my book. Uh, so so I'll do books. I'm on four corporate boards, two wow. two private and two public. And so that's important to me because, wow. um, you know, some of these corporations really need some insight. Yeah. Uh, they need to have uh, more people at the table uh, that looks like us in order to even, you know, be profitable. And they know that. I mean, so they these boards have sought me out and I'm on some fun boards with some great people. Um, and so I'll continue to do that and one day give them more time because it, it really is uh, impactful. And then so books, boards and better. And the better is all the nonprofit piece and mostly around children, around women and families. I mean, making sure that I am given my time, talent and treasure and to making sure we, the marshals, are given our time, talent and treasure yeah. to make things better. I want some kids to wake up. You know, I had a lot of colleges recruiting me before I took this job to be a yeah, college president. Yeah, to be a president. And so yeah. I just had to. And that's why I wanted to take a year off and just figure out what was next. But but I still believe what I believed back in 2018 when I ended up saying yes to Mark is that there is something else out there big for me to do where some kid or somebody is going to wake up and their life is going to be significantly better. Like every day I want a kid to wake up and their life is significantly better because of something I'm doing. They won't know it's me, but I will know that I'm impacting kids yeah. every day. So whether it's around adoption, school, I don't know what yeah. it is, but that's what I want to devote uh, my life to. Yeah. I want, I just want things to be better. So when I leave these, this earth, and I already told my kids, when I leave this earth, I want them to just have a little sign that said, she left it better than she found it. Yes. That's all I want. I just want to yes. make it better. She left it better than she found it. Sent Marshall, it has been my pleasure. It has been an honor to talk to you. Oh. You are phenomenal. Seize the moment, have courageous conversations. Yes. Be brave, but have some faith have some on faith. every part of the journey. And some fun. God, have some fun, because ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no mountain high enough. Hey, hey, I threw it in there. Baby. You saw it. <laughs> Come on now, church. You got it. The Marvin Gaye, Tammy Terrell version. <laughs> the fast version. Yes. But I like inclusion, too, so we can throw in the Michael McDonald version. Okay. okay. But we, we I like only, Diana, too, but that one's We only like... know the Tammy Terrell and my, uh, Marvin exactly. Gaye version. Exactly. That's the only one that okay, counts. That's the, that's thank at the you. cookout. That's it. That's Listen, at the cookout. That's at the cookout. That's at the cookout. That's at the cookout. It's been my pleasure. Sint Marshall, thank you for joining us on Bought and Powers Talks where we don't just scratch the surface, we dive deep into the lives of some of the world's most influential change makers. I'm your host, Brandi Harvey. Until next time, eat well, give a damn, move your body every day. Peace.